Cool. All right. Hey, everybody. Nice to see some people that I recognize, some people that I don't. Happy to meet everybody here. So today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you guys about how I used serverless technologies, specifically with AWS, to solve a problem that I had very recently back in December. So I built an open source newsletter platform that everybody here can go and download the code, deploy it into AWS, and have their own newsletter platform. So I'm going to go through the the features that it has, what the need was, a little bit about my newsletter, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. There's some other things in there too. So again, thank you for joining me today. I'm excited to go over this. This is a pretty cool app, probably one of the, the most fun that I've built. Without further ado, just want to talk a little bit about myself just so you guys know who I am. I work at a company called Momento where we build a serverless uh, caching service. I am the content creator behind Ready, Set, Cloud. If you've ever seen anything from that domain, I write all the blog posts, the, the newsletter, the serverless picks of the week newsletter. I have a new podcast uh, that's coming out, just released an episode today. And then I am an, an AWS serverless hero. Just kind of backtrack a little bit to talk about that. I've been in tech for just about 11 years. I worked at a company called Tyler Technologies for all of that, except for the past two weeks. I moved over to Memento two weeks ago. I saw I was a developer for seven of those years, first seven straight out of college. And in early 2019, I was asked to lead some cloud native teams. So we were primarily on-prem. And then I was asked to build a team and explore the cloud, figure it out. So I led some top-notch engineers on an RD mission into the cloud, into the serverless space, where I found there wasn't a lot of documentation, a lot of production-ready use cases uh, out there available online. So what I ended up doing is I, I built Ready, Set, Cloud, and I documented the journey and became an AWS community builder uh, three years ago. Highly recommend the program if you're not in it. And middle of last year, middle of uh, 2022, graduated to be a serverless hero. And then probably the most important thing on this entire slide is that I am a pseudo farmer. I have 39 chickens and turkeys on my property. We have eggs if, if you need eggs. So let's talk about what we're actually going to talk about today. Let's, let's keep going. So uh, first we're going to talk about the newsletter, what it is and why we're even here and why I had a, a need to build something. We're going to talk about my definition of serverless. In December of last year, that was probably the, uh, one of the most debated topics that I saw online was what is serverless? What does it mean? So we're going to talk about what I mean when I say it. We're, then we're going to dive in. Uh, we're going to cover the entirety of what I built for the newsletter solution. And then we'll wrap it up by me proving that this is not just smoke and mirrors. And I'll, I'll walk you through the code. So exclusive sneak peek on that one. I have not shown the code of anything ready, set, cloud related to anybody. So I'm nervous. Do not judge. So a little bit about the newsletter, just to set the stage of what it is. So I've been doing it for just about a year and it's content, it's catered content. So it's intended to be the best of the content that was created last week. Cloud moves so fast, but especially serverless moves even more fast. So what I do is I go through and I scour the internet every single week, find the posts that really speak to me, something that is really cool that I haven't seen done before or a really cool use case, or maybe somebody is proposing a best practice. I gather all those and ship them out every Monday uh, at 9 a.m. Central. So if you're interested in serverless at all, please do take a look because it is, it is, there is a lot of good content in there. Some of it's mine, most of it's not really good stuff. Maxime, you're in there on Monday. We'll see that here in a minute. Here we go. So here's the here's the process that I would go through with my original workflow. So really what, what we're talking about in this whole talk is how I took my old workflow with Review, which was a newsletter service from Twitter. That went down and how I moved over to this one, how I built a, a serverless newsletter app and moved over and optimized the process. So this is the process that I used to go through before Review went down and shut its doors forever. So six step process, I would research, like we just talked about, go through all the mediums and websites, people post content. I would write it. Everything that I write and create is written in Markdown. So my website is 
generated with a static site generator called Hugo, and it converts all this markdown content into HTML. And then I use AWS Amplify to host that content and, and deliver it to you behind a CloudFront distribution. So write the markdown and then run the code locally. So I run the website on my local machine, review it, see how it looks. Then what I would do is I would copy the rendered stuff when I'm running it locally and paste it into review. And that was okay at best because the editor in review wasn't very good. It was, it was a WYSIWYG editor, but it was not super flexible. Like I'd paste everything over, but I'd have to then reinsert images, add sections, specifically embed tweets. It was a whole thing. It, it was a whole thing. And I often did it wrong. And it took me a long time every week after week to, to get it right. After that, I would publish it on review. I would say, yes, please send this at 9 a.m. Central time. And then I would go back to Visual Studio Code where I had written everything in Markdown and commit and push to my repository in GitHub. So two different areas there. Now, that was nice. But it also kind of, it was nice in the sense that I had a, an external newsletter service or email service. I didn't have to manage users. I didn't have to manage subscribers. I didn't have to go through and manage actually sending the email. Now that's hard, but there's a whole lot of computer science behind it that I didn't want to do. And, and there's a lot of analytics and, and things that just worked well. It was integrated directly with my Twitter profile. So you would see my face, my name, and then sign up for my newsletter, which I really liked. That was, that was super nice uh, feature of review. It's actually why I chose it the first time. The part that sucked is that I did have to do double work. I would write it in my repository and then have to copy and paste it. I never did it the same way twice. There was this little horizontal line that I could not get rid of in review. If you go and you look at the history of the emails that I sent out week over week, that line would be in a different section pretty much every week while I was trying to figure out where does it look the least bad. So it was always a little bit different. And then I always forgot I'm relatively lazy when it comes to these things, but I always have a, a sponsor in my newsletter and we'll talk about this in a little bit. But one of the courtesies that I like to do is send an email to say, hey, you have a, a sponsored ad coming up on Monday. Do you want to change the ad that we ran last week? And the answer is always yes. But a lot of times I would just forget to send the reminder and it wouldn't be until Friday before where I would say, hey, I forgot to remind you, I need an ad. Please hurry and do that before you go away for the weekend. So I didn't want to do that because that's not super nice. I have two things that I was running. A Hugo, which is the static site generator. This is what was turning the markdown content I wrote in my repository into a static website that is ready, set, cloud. And then we also had the ephemeral version, which is the emails that went, uh, that went out every week via review. But I got an email from Twitter in December that said, no more. It's going away in the middle of January. So I had about a month to figure out what on earth was I going to do. That was a, I did not want to interrupt the service. So I had to figure out back to the drawing board. Let's let's move quickly, which was really unfortunate because it was December and I had a lot of time off to celebrate Christmas and do things that were not in front of a screen. So let me recap one more time. This is where we were. The process was a six step process, write, move, copy, publish, right? Basically double of everything. And you now I had things that I liked and I had things that I didn't like. So in December, it was close to Christmas and I was like, okay, well, these are all the things that I have, but what do I need? How am I going to improve this coming into 2023? So I looked at, at everything that I had and I was like, okay, well, as far as the process goes, I do not want to copy, paste, replace anymore. That is a lot of work. And I'm just over here trying to optimize my time because I have two kids and 39 chickens and turkeys. So what that resulted in also was I don't want to do anything I don't like anymore. So what can I do? What can I build to get rid of the dislikes and that kind of manifested itself into a set of requirements and it was real easy to describe as far as requirements go you know, i wanted something that i could easily turn around i wanted something that i didn't have to do hardly any work on an ongoing basis i was fine building something i wanted cool stats i got really nice stats out of review and i didn't want to lose that and then probably the most important thing to me, I, like in almost all seriousness, is that I was trying to get something that was free. Now, I'm very used to building things with serverless technologies 
And at one person scale, everything is free. And I wanted to have essentially the same thing when it came to the, the newsletter. Review was free and I wanted it to stay free. So it's thinking, it's okay, what does that mean? What, what do I have to do? And I made the realization, okay, I am an AWS serverless hero and this is a really good opportunity to share with the community what you do in situations that you find yourself in a pickle. So I was like, okay, I'm going to build it. So if you want, that's a QR code straight to a blog post that I wrote about becoming a serverless hero. It's a very fun read. It's different for everybody. It's actually not a very, it's not a prescriptive process to become one, but you can read about my story there. So I decided, okay, we're building, we're going serverless. Let's do that. And before I continue into the solution, I told you I was going to tell you what my definition of serverless was. This is actually adapted from Memento. I believed in this before I started working there. And it really sums up to these five points. The first one being hands-free, meaning there's no instances involved at all. I just want to use it. I don't want to provision anything. I just want to say, use this and it works. Pay as you go. I don't want to pay for unused infrastructure. So I only write a newsletter one day a week. I don't want to pay for something that charges me for seven days a week. A low barrier to entry. I don't want to have to spin my wheels configuring. It should just work. Single API call, only pass in a few params. Boom, done. Serverless. No downtime, no provision windows. It's hand in hand with the no provision resources. It just works. The vendor provides that abstraction for me, so it's always available. And then it, it scales. It elastically scales with, with demand. So if there's no demand, if nobody is using it, not doing anything if 100,000 people are using it at the same time it feels like one person so that that's serverless in my eyes I know not everybody feels that way but this is what I mean when I say it. okay so now we're going to talk a little bit about the solution that it came up with and the very first thing that I had to do was find an email engine because I wasn't about to go and build one of those so if you remember the requirements were I want cool analytics and I want free so that's what I was looking at at the beginning, I assess these five and I'm not going to read and, and talk about all these things. Everybody asks me immediately when I talk about making a newsletter platform, they're like, oh, you used SES from Amazon. I did not. It does not have anywhere near the type of support built in that you would expect with a newsletter. It doesn't have campaign support. It doesn't have these analytics. It doesn't really have subscriber tracking. I didn't want to have to build that. I wanted something that I already had it built. So MailChimp, Send and Blue, Convert Kit, they all have very similar offerings, but a very good problem that I had was my newsletter had actually outscaled the free tier. So they all have very palatable free tier options, but serverless picks of the week was already too big for that. And I wasn't about to start paying 20 to $50 a month to do that. SendGrid actually did everything that I needed. And before I go on and talk about how great SendGrid is, I have to put a disclaimer that I... I'm not affiliated with SendGrid. It's just a really good product that works. So let's talk about the free tier and why I chose it over the other one. The free tier of SendGrid allows you to track up to 2,000 subscribers uh, for free, and you can send up to 6,000 marketing emails a month. The newsletter is technically a marketing campaign, not just a, a standard status update email. So you can do that. It has all the analytics built in. We'll talk about those in a little bit, specifically what they are. Uh, and then it has an API that does everything that I needed. You have dynamic templates, you have user management, you have campaign creation. One of the things that I was actually surprised about, so Twilio bought SendGrid a few years ago, and I consider Twilio to be the cream of the crop when it comes to developer documentation, developer experience. SendGrid is not there yet. Their documents for their API are somewhat stale and in some cases incorrect. So that was actually like legitimately the hardest part of this project was figuring out what actually worked, but I'm not here to slight SendGrid because they've actually enabled me to do a whole lot. So overall, very good. If you need help integrating with their API, please reach out. So here's the process. Here's end to end what the new process is. So I write my newsletter in Markdown, push it up to my main branch in GitHub. That triggers an Amplify build. And when that's done, it publishes an event bridge event, fires land function. That function goes back to GitHub 
pulls the markdown file that was just added and then passes it along to a step function, which has a whole bunch of things that we'll talk about and then sends it over to the same grid. So as far as what I was starting with or what the playing field was, I already had just the first part and the happy readers. So that meant that I had to build all these other things, which is fine, but it felt lofty at the beginning, honestly, because there was a big question around how the heck do I do this part? How do I trigger work from an Amplify build? I reached out to Michael, who's actually in the audience today. Hey, Michael, thank you again for your help. And he did some digging into Amplify and down into the source code, I think into the undocumented dark area and discovered that on a successful build, Amplify will publish an event bridge event. And that looks like this over here. When he told me that event exists and here's the format, I went over to Sam, which is my infrastructure's code of choice and added this to a Lambda function. And lo and behold, that Lambda function fired every time I had a successful build, which was super awesome. And that was the part, that was the unknown part to me. It was how we triggered that logic based on a build. Cause really what I wanted was to make sure that the build was successful because I wanted to make sure that if something did fail for whatever reason, I wasn't going to be sending out data from a potentially uh, breaking update. So the other part is processing. It's this big step function. I'm a big step function fan. If you were here last time I talked at uh, serverless Boston in, in New York, I talked about, let's just try to avoid Lambda almost entirely and use step functions instead. Here is what my step function looks like that actually takes my markdown file out of GitHub and sends it over to SendGrid. And I'll, I'll go high level over what this does. So the first few things, it hits Dynamo a couple of times, and that's really just for item potency, because the last thing I want is for this to fail, retry, and then for some reason, send three or four copies of the same newsletter to everybody. That would be a terrible experience, and I would blow through free tier very fast in SendGrid if that happened every time. So it goes in and checks, it has a hash between the commit SHA from GitHub and the files that it's processing, and it goes and builds an item potency key for that. The next thing that we have is parsing the newsletter. So this is, a, there's a lot of logic in here. And so what it's doing is it's taking the markdown content and it's transforming it into HTML. It's also enriching sponsor details. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then it's taking the new HTML that it formed and creating a JSON object for a dynamic template. And the dynamic template is actually what we're using to push data into SendGrid for consistency. So SendGrid has a really nice user interface around building templated emails. We'll actually look at this one in the demo where it says, I can parameterize all these things. And as long as I pass in a structured object into the API call, it will resolve and merge all my data into the proper HTML format. So that's what we're doing in this stage to send grid. So we're taking the data that I created in Lambda function one, merging it into the dynamic template in Lambda function two, it's creating the campaign in send grid terminology. It's called a single send, which is a marketing one-time email. And then it's scheduling that to be sent out at 9 a.m on the following Monday. The next section that we have in here is for my own analytics. We'll talk about this in a minute. One of those two is actually for item potency. It's to say, yes, we, we did this successfully. And the last thing that it does is it sends me an email to my personal email that says, hey, things are good to go. So if you look over in the right-hand corner, I have a step functions logo points to an email, and then it has a arrow back to send grid. This was something that frustrated me a lot at the beginning, because what I wanted was it to be 100% automated. I wanted to push the code and then the campaign be sent to everybody. But I could not figure that out for the life of me in the API. I talked to their support, said you can't automatically send a campaign email. You have to manually push the button. And honestly, that saved me a couple of times. What that does is it provides a, here is your rendered version. Do you like it? it it's basically the th an opportunity for me to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down to say, yes, this newsletter looks good. And, and so I've caught a couple of typos and formatting errors a couple of times early on in this process that I have had the opportunity to fix before sending it out to hundreds of people. And so that was actually a blessing in disguise. And we'll go over what this looks like in a minute. 
I talked a little bit about sponsors and what uh, feature set this newsletter platform has. I just want to talk about the sponsors just in general, because I built some cool features around this that I haven't seen anywhere. So sponsors in general, I have companies that pay me money in exchange for me inserting a relatable ad in the content. They usually buy blocks. I have people that buy anywhere from four in a row to an entire uh, quarter of the year in a row. They need reminders. Typically what these sponsors will do is they'll want to run a different ad every newsletter because they're creating content just like we all are. So they want to push something else. So I built that reminder in there to send them an email on Wednesdays of the week before they have a email going out. And the last thing here that I think is probably the coolest thing is this dynamic placement. So when I first started sending out sponsor emails, I had always put the sponsor ad at the very bottom. If you know anything about content creation, most of your readers don't make it. So most people were not seeing the sponsored ad, which is really bad because you have to give them your analytics to say, hey, you got this many clicks from this newsletter, which ends up being really low when the ad's at the bottom. What I ended up doing is I built a, an ejectable sponsor ad placement in the content so it can go and put the sponsor ad somewhere relevant, not at the bottom, but somewhere that flows nicer inside of the newsletter itself. We'll cover that in a sec. So sponsor tracking, I have two files in here. I have a, a calendar which shows who is sponsoring which issue. And over on the right hand side, I have the details about the sponsor, like their name, where's the logo, what's their homepage, uh, and who do you contact to send an email to the email reminder. So this is used for all the automations that I have around there for picking up and just injecting some of the sponsor data in the newsletter. And talking about injecting data inside of the newsletter. So on the left-hand side is the front matter of a newsletter, and that's essentially just the metadata about it. It doesn't get rendered anywhere. It's the metadata that describes the actual newsletter itself. It, it gets put in, and some of that's used in SEO. Some of it is used just to decorate some of the stuff in my website. But you can see on 9 and 10 on the left, the sponsor information with 9 being who is sponsoring, and 10 being the actual ad that runs. On the right-hand side, we have a short code that I built in Hugo that takes the ad, formats it, and puts it wherever that short code is. It be at the very top, it could be in the middle, it could be at the end, doesn't matter. It will render a very nice looking ad wherever it goes. And the back end as well that parses the newsletter specifically looks for that short code and does the same. So that was really nice. And I saw immediate improvements in click-through rate for sponsored ads. And so I talked about sponsor reminders. So those go out on, on Wednesdays. I usually write the, the newsletter on Fridays and ship it out on Mondays. So on Wednesdays, this sends an email to point of contact that says, hey, I need a new ad from you, please. So the first thing that it does, it goes and gets the calendar and says, okay, when's the next issue coming? I'm going to go find the, find the sponsor. If I do have a sponsor for the next issue, it goes and it loads that data about that sponsor, it iterates through, finds the sponsor, and then sends them a templated email. It says, you have an ad coming on this date. Do you want me to run a new one for you? If not, I will run the old one. Analytics. So I talked a little bit about this. I, don't, I didn't want to lose this from what I had before, and I wanted a couple of extra points to track with the new solution. So one of the things that I was gauging and estimating on these uh, newsletter platforms when I was doing an assessment were, were things like deliveries, bounce rates, opens, click-through rate. That's what CTR is. That's how many people are clicking on a link inside of my newsletter to make sure that I'm actually providing captivating content. I wanted to know, is the newsletter growing? I wanted to know how many subscribers do I have this week versus last week as just to make sure that I'm creating content that the audience cares about. And then the last one there, the reputation, that is, if you're unfamiliar with marketing campaigns, it's everything. That is how likely is it that my newsletter is going to hit your inbox versus your spam folder. And that's something that I don't know anything about besides the name reputation. So I wanted to push that off as best I could to a service that knows everything about it, aka SendGrid. So I can see the, the reputation. They can give me suggestions on what I'm doing wrong that would increase or, or decrease the likelihood of going to Spain. All right. 
So the stats that I have, these are directly out of SendGrid. And this is the newsletter from this week. It's really nice. It has how many people it was sent to, how many bounces, how many clicks, how many opens, how many people unsubscribed. And it also shows day by day who opened what. So I can very clearly see if you're not going to open it the day it gets delivered, you're not going to open it at all. And it's really nice, right? I can, there's a whole bunch more in here. It shows which links were clicked and at what rate it shows the people that clicked and have consistent things. You can track individuals. It's pretty neat. But the problem is, like I said before, I have a lot of things to do and I often forget to come here. I just don't even, I don't open SendGrid hardly ever because it just works and it does its own thing. So I want to see this information. I just usually forget. And what I ended up doing was sending an email to myself. <laughs> this whole thing is about email. It goes, so this email, it, it hits my inbox every Friday morning just to see how did this week's go. I, I give it five days for people to open and click on some links and then I track those and send it back to myself. So you can see this is from this week, 510 people delivered to one bounce. Now, you don't want bounces, by the way. The more that happens, the lower your reputation gets. So I need to figure out who's bouncing so I can remove them from the list. But at the bottom, it also shows the amount of subscribers that I had this week or that I had as of today. Actually, this email came this morning. How many I have this morning versus how many I had a Friday at the same time. So you can see I got 20 new subscribers this week. It's pretty nice. And that link that says view full report takes me to that page we were just looking at before so I can jump straight to it. That's super nice. As you can probably imagine, this is powered by another step function. This one is much simpler than the other ones. This is get me the latest newsletter out of Dynamo, hit the SendGrid API a couple of times to get the stats, get the current subscriber counts, and then load the subscriber count from last week. One of the analytics that I wanted was the week over week subscriber count, and that's not something SendGrid does. So I tracked it myself. So that's what those two uh, Dynamo puts and in inquiries are. They're where I'm storing the subscriber count from Fridays. And that last one is sending them the actual email to me. Pretty nice. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. We talked about finding the email vendor. We talked about sponsors, about analytics, about all the automation that I wanted and the automation that I implemented. We talked about the definition of serverless and how it's enabled us to move quickly and free, which is really nice. So the only thing left is the demo. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and walk through that. So for the first time, I'm showing somebody else that's not me, the source code for Ready, Set, Cloud. So this is this week's, rather next week, newsletter. So I have all my front matter in here, the sponsor ad. You can see that it's coming out on the 13th, which is Monday. You can see down here, you can see Maxine's name. So uh, thank you for landed perf, that's pretty cool. And then you just to see some other stuff in here. So what I would do before is I would run this locally and copy the text and move over to review, but I don't have to do that anymore. Instead, all I have to do is push this. And the thing that triggers everything, I push things that aren't newsletters all the time. I could be making an edit to the styling of the website. I could be writing a blog post. I could be doing a podcast. So the thing that triggers the whole process is bracketing newsletter in the commit message. That's how that Lambda function that gets triggered on a successful build knows, oh, there's a new newsletter. So I will go ahead and say new newsletter 46, let's go. And so at this point, I've been running this website for about four years. There's a lot of content in there. It takes Amplify three, four minutes. And so rather than just staring at VS code or my email inbox until I get the email that says everything staged. I want to show you SendGrid because I talked about the dynamic templates and I don't think I described it well because it's just such a cool feature and I want to make sure that I do it justice. So in here, I have the email API, I have dynamic templates and inside I have my newsletter template. If I click into it, it has a WYSIWYG editor that shows all these parameterized values and sections for my newsletter. So I have my logo up here at the top. I have parameterized the issue number and the name of the issue. 
the dates, the link to the copy on my website. You can click on any of these in code and see it's really just HTML and handlebars template. If you've used handlebars and click out of that, that's really all it is. There is a section in here that I have. This is probably the most important one. This one is a loop. It says for every section that I have, so it looks for H2 in the markdown for every one of those, go ahead and render it. Here's the header and here's the text. Just one for one, just formatted nicely in HTML. And so what, what this actually uses, Sangrid has this nice preview. So in the test data here, it has a metadata object and I have information that comes from the markdown file in from GitHub, sorry. And it has things like, this is issue number 37. This is the title. It changes dynamically. Oh no, I tried to do, no, no. That's what I'd get for going off script. There we go. That's what I wanted. So exclamation point, so I added the exclamation point over there. So I can actually test this in real time and see, I save it if I want. But this is just a template, right? What's happening behind the scenes in that entire process is it's generating this, or my state machine is generating this object parsing the markdown, generating this object, and then passing that object into this dynamic template to render something that looks nice and readable. Okay. So we don't actually want to see that. Okay. I haven't gotten the email yet, or maybe I have my email closed. Let's open it up. Nope, not yet. Like I said, it takes a couple of minutes inside of Amplify to, to build and then only two seconds to do everything else. I can show you inside of SendGrid, what it does is it creates these single sends in the marketing section. Oh, there it is. So I just haven't gotten the email yet, but you can see that this is the newsletter that we just made. So you can see 46, you can see down here about landed per, and this is what is going to be emailed out to the 526 people that subscribe to the newsletter. Disappointed that the email didn't come through because that part I think is the coolest thing. There it is. There we go. Okay. So all it says, the newsletter was successfully staged. I click that and it jumps me straight to the review. So it has all the metadata about this specific single send. It shows me the preview of it over here on the right. If I don't like something for whatever reason, I can click the back and edit the content directly out of here, uh, or I can go back into the source code and send the whole thing off again. But whenever it's done, I say, yeah, that looks good. So you can see here it's scheduled for Monday at nine. I can hit schedule. Yes. Let's send that on Monday. And it's good. It'll say it's scheduled and hands off the rest of the whole process, which is super. So with that, there's the end of the demo. Here's my uh, final slide. This is the time for questions. If you have questions, there is a lot more, actually, no, we dove pretty deep. There is more potential information in the blog post that I wrote about this, or if you want the GitHub repo, it's right there. So you can find me on any of the socials if you want. Thank you.